Hi, my name is Marcus and I'm researching the physics of large scale wind farms. Today we'll be exploring how we optimise our wind turbines. We have three main objectives today. Firstly, we want to know how we got to the design we have today. Secondly, we're going to want to have an understanding of some of the impacts on a turbine due to its surroundings. And lastly, we'll try and apply this understanding to decide how best to place or arrange our turbines. I wanted to start off by talking about why we should even care about optimising our turbines. Why even have them at all? The reason boils down to our society's need for energy and the impacts of climate change. The figure on the left shows the world's energy consumption by source. We can see that both our demand for energy is growing and the amount that we get from non-renewable or polluting energy sources dominates our energy production. This demand is expected to grow by 50% by 2050. So we need to drastically improve the amount of energy we receive from renewable sources. So why a turbine and why are they designed the way they are? The turbine part can be answered easily and that's because turning a turbine to create electricity is incredibly efficient. It's so good that all our major electricity generators work by spinning a turbine. A dam turns a turbine by releasing water with a high gravitational potential energy. Nuclear, coal, gas, these all generally work by heating up water, which rises as steam and again turns a turbine. So with wind power, instead of us controlling the movement of fluid through a turbine, the atmosphere does that work for us. And so sort of when I mention fluid here, um, I'm talking about either a liquid or a gas, as mathematically they obey the same equations of motion for us, um, just with different thicknesses, or what we also call viscosity. Now, why the three blades and not four from the historic Dutch windmills, or more like this turbine that you can see on the right of this figure? Well, it comes down to drag. The more blades, the more surfaces, then the drag will increase, which ideally we don't want. So we try and minimise the blades. However, we don't want only one or two blades because that would make the turbine unbalanced and unstable as it sort of turns and moves to face incoming wind or just as it spins in general. So the smallest stable number for us is three. So we can think of a turbine working as it extracts some of the momentum from an incoming flow to rotate the turbine and create electricity. Shown in this diagram here, where the longer arrows represent a faster flowing fluid, figure A is relatively simple. We have a realistic looking inflow that has sort of slow uh, moving flow near the ground and it gets faster as we get higher up. Uh, the profile of the flow behind the turbine is also quite simple with the flow that passed through the turbine being slowed by the same amount. The flow profile behind B is a little more accurate as the centre hub of the turbine will slow the flow in the middle more as air can't really pass through a solid object. And the speed of the flow is a lot smoother with no big jumps in the flow speed like we can see um, behind A. If we think about optimising this simplified turbine here and all we can control is the speed of the flow that makes it through the turbine, we're also going to pretend here that all the air is moving at the same speed and if it hits the turbine it all gets slowed down by the same amount. If all of it makes it through the turbine then the turbine is doing nothing and generates no power which can be seen on the graph at the right um, sort of when the speed through the turbine as a percentage of the incoming speed is one so all of it makes it through it's the same speed um, and we can see we've got zero turbine efficiency here because essentially the turbine is doing nothing but if the speed equals zero um, the turbine is extracting all the speed from the flow however this can't quite work as all of the wind would have to come to a complete stop when it comes in contact with the turbine in order to stop the wind completely the air wouldn't be able to move out the way behind the turbine which would prevent further air from coming in and coming through it and then stopping the turbine. 
The turbine at this point essentially acts as a huge wall in the sky and just diverts flow around itself, uh, losing out on any sort of flow it could have extracted energy from. So the optimum is at a point in which the turbine can extract as much speed from the flow without diverting too much of it around the turbine itself. It turns out that this point is when the turbine slows the flow down to two thirds of its original speed, which works out to be about 59.3% of the available kinetic energy from the wind can be used to generate electricity. So that is our current sort of upper limit for a turbine on its own. However, we've made a fair few assumptions here about the physics of this system. Feel free to take time to pause the video here for a minute and try to come up with some of the simplifications that were made. So I've included a couple of assumptions here. One, there's no environment, no sea, no ground, no nothing. Also, no tower which will impact the flow, so we currently have magically floating spinning disks in the sky. All the flow, both incoming and outcoming, is very uniform, very square. Um, in reality, it will be more curved, um, like in some of the earlier diagrams. Also, no spinning turbine blades. It turns out that having three, possibly 50 meter long, maybe more blades spinning through the air can have a big impact on how the air behaves behind it. What we're going to focus on here is the no environment part of the assumption, and in particular the fact that we had nothing around the turbine itself, no ground, not even any other turbines. So what we can consider here is what if we put the turbine in sort of a blocked channel? This means the fluid is no longer allowed to escape as easily around the turbine, it's confined. This confinement can appear due to a few different factors. One of these is there could be sort of physical walls from placing a turbine in a river, for example, or barriers could be created by symmetry. If we have two turbines acting identically, they'll have a line of symmetry between them which acts as a barrier because any flow on one side trying to move to the other will be cancelled out exactly by uh, the flow on the other side, mirroring it. As this barrier limits the diversion of flow, we can improve the amount of kinetic energy the turbine extracts from the flow as we get to worry less and less about the flow diversion uh, when it extracts more and more speed from the incoming flow. This graph on the right shows the increase in the maximum power coefficient. Um, this is one of our metrics when measuring turbine performance. As we decrease the size of the channel or sort of bring two turbines closer together, um, another feature of having our turbine in a blocked region is that by conservation of momentum, the flow around the turbine will speed up. Um, we can also use this faster flow um, to our advantage. So I mentioned we could use this faster flow to our advantage, but just how much extra energy can we get by using this fast flow? These figures are as if we were looking at the farm from above. Um, we can ignore the big orange boxes for now. Um, in the last slide, we looked at um, a single confined turbine, which is essentially the blue dash box in figure A. To see how much extra power we can extract, we'll look at an arrangement like B, where each turbine is placed so it's between two upstream turbines. So what are the power differences? Well, that depends on how much of the fast flow we want to take advantage of still exists when we get to the next turbines. Because as the air moves, the fast and slow speeds will start to mix and equalize. We will represent this mixing happening in this big orange box for simplicity uh, before the air hits the next turbines. If mixing is equal to one here, then it all becomes the same speed. And if mixing is zero, then no mixing occurs. 
The plot on the right shows the turbine efficiency average for two turbine rows, uh, sort of like in the figure on the left. Uh, blue is for low numbers and sort of the more yellow it gets, we get to higher numbers. Um, is the way we're representing uh, the colors here. And also at the bottom blockage of 0 0.2 here means that the turbine takes up 20% of its channel. We can see that when the fast flow is more present, in other words, there isn't much mixing, uh, we get much better performance taking the turbine taking up 20% of the channel example. Um, so this is the far right on the right plot. 100% mixing has a turbine efficiency of around 0 0.9, it looks like. Whereas with lower mixing, as we go down the plot, um, to about 0 0.6 at the bottom, it has an average efficiency of 1.15, which is roughly a 25% improvement. Now, we're going to look more into large numbers of turbines in a farm, much like in the simulation we have playing here. We've already seen this arrangement previously in a simpler manner, but as we add more and more realistic features, it gets a lot more messy to look at. So we're going to go back and look at some different arrangements in a simplified way again. What we can try and think of now is if we're building a wind farm, what's the best way we can arrange these turbines? How can we best place them? Again, I'll give you some time to pause the video and think about which one of these potential arrangements uh, you think will have the best overall performance. The best performing arrangement was C overall, with an up to 40% improvement over case A where the turbines were all aligned. Now we can go back a slide and talk about maybe why. Firstly, A is pretty easy to rule out, as the slow flow behind a turbine always directly hits the next row of turbines. And then if we offset every other row, so we get the arrangement in D. Now we have every second row of turbines benefiting from the fast diverted flow we spoke about earlier. Um, if we only had two rows, D would be the best performing. But then a lot of the later turbines encounter the slow flow from the upstream turbines. B isn't too bad as there is a long gap between turbines directly behind each other. But as you can see, each turbine after the first row is half in the slow flow from the turbines in front of them, which sort of brings us to C. This one works well because each turbine is just outside the slower speed behind a turbine, so it can catch the fast diverted flow, but it also benefits from being a longer gap between turbines which sit directly behind each other. So unlike A and D, where turbines encounter slow flow from the upstream turbines very often, uh, the process is delayed in both B and C, allowing the flow more time to recover before it hits another turbine. So in summary, we spoke about the need for increased renewable energy sources and a couple reasons why we have the turbine designs we have today. We noted that there are a lot of physical features that impacted a turbine's performance. And specifically, we saw how changing the layout of our wind farm can increase the power extracted by up to 40%. Optimizing these designs can have a large impact on our path to net zero. And as we saw at the start, there is a lot of non-renewable energy sources to replace. If you want to play around with fluid flows or see some other information on wind turbines, I've added a couple links here. Thanks for sticking around.